Ladies and gentlemen, my name is Paul, and in this Rick to Income video, we're going to be discussing and analysing tech news, which, as usual, popped up over the past 24 or so hours. We're going to start things out with a whole deluge of touring news and rumours. The first one being the identification of exactly what the A stands for on certain GPU cores. For example, the RTX 2080 Ti features the GPU core, which is known as the TU-102-300. Although we have seen some photos of that particular core which have an A after it, so that would be the TU-102-300A. Uh, what does that actually mean? What the heck does the A actually represent? Well, now we have an answer thanks to the folks over at techpowerup.com. They were conducting research because they are, of course, the administrators and the owners of the application GPU-Z, which is a really cool utility. If you've not checked it out, you should. And when they were reaching out to industry contacts, AIBs and the like, they have been uh, given the information that the A represents the GPU cores, which are for the overclocked versions of these cards. So, for example, NVIDIA have two variants of the own reference design. They have the standard edition and they also have those which are boosting as well. They have like a 90 megahertz overclock compared to the other versions. Now, this does tie in rather nicely with a set of questions that I was posing, and a great n number of you were as well. Does that mean that there's going to be a difference in quality in terms of the raw silicon that's used between those two particular versions? It also means that if you have the A version, then, of course, an AIB can sell an OC version of that card. But the non-A cores cannot, they cannot be used for overclocked cards. So what does that mean? Well, it's hard to know just yet because we don't have enough data. But what it could possibly mean is that, let's say that you buy an overclocked version of the card, right? You might get, on average, a better overclock compared to a standard version which is not overclocked because, in theory at least, you have better quality silicon. Now, previous versions, let's say Pascal or Maxwell or whatever, it was still some level of the silicon lottery. You could buy a gaming X from MSI, you could buy like a Strix from Asus, you get the idea by now. And that, of course, is factory overclocked, right? But it doesn't necessarily mean there's much more left in the tank. So, for example, if you have 100 megahertz just putting out that additional uh, clock speed on the core and whatever else on the memory, that might be almost the ceiling. That core might have just about scraped by those clocks. On the other hand, you could buy like a standard reference blower from MSI or Asus or whomever, and that might have had lots left in the tank, but it was held back by the cooler. So that means that if you buy one of the cheaper cards, at least in theory, with the idea behind it to water cool it, because a lot of people do, they'll just buy like the cheapest version of the card if they're planning to like slap a different uh, block on it. It makes sense, right? Why would you spend the extra for a really fancy cooler? Of course, there are some benefits, like better VRMs and so on. And yeah, there you go. So in theory, at least, the average overclocks will be inferior for the non-300A versions. But that is just a theory, and we don't really know yet because we don't have enough data. There is a possibility that if you have a custom BIOS, and that's if you can flash a custom BIOS, like it, it's unlockable and all that stuff, and you can squeeze enough extra voltage through it. And don't forget... Turing is said to be built for overclocking. Now, of course, how that represents uh, real-life performance is unknown yet. And when you combine that with better VRMs and better power distribution and so on and so on, right now it's still a mystery just how well these cards are going to overclock. So just be aware of that, and I thought I would throw it in. Speaking of AIBs, Asus recently had a rather fascinating interview with the website PC Watch. I'll link it in the video description, of course. And there were a couple of really, really, really important things that we've learned from this interview. The first one is that the RTX 2060 and 2050, or GTX 2050 and 2060, or whether it's going to be called the Mango 2050 or 2060, no one really knows yet, they are not being released this year. In fact, we're not going to see them until 2019. I'm not particularly surprised by this. I have a feeling a lot of you aren't surprised by this. And it makes sense because, well, we've not seen really any benchmarks yet for it. There's not been any, you know, leaks of it really. We've had a couple of possible leaks here and there, but nothing solid. And when you consider that NVIDIA are very happy to get rid of the old Pascal inventory, and of course gamers are happy to gobble it up as well, 
everyone's a winner, so it does make sense for them to hold back the cards. I mean, let's face it, if you could buy like a cheap GTX 1080 or something, for a good price this side of Christmas, then absolutely fine. And when you combine that with previous news from Nvidia themselves that the Pascal lineup of cards is going to remain on store shelves until they've gotten rid of them, which is most likely going to be around the holiday season, all of it just works together. It, you know, there's some, the, it, it just, it, it just works. But the other piece of news, uh, once again, according to an Asus representative who was speaking to PC Watch, is that Turing was originally intended to not to be built on the manufacturing process that it was. Now, you may say to yourself, well, golly then, what was it supposed to be built on? The 7NM process, right? That would be the shoe-in. That was a lot of theories. No, it was actually designed around the 10NM process. So what happened is, though, that NVIDIA did not feel confident on yields and maturity of the process, thus they decided to stick with 12NM. Although, according to this interview, NVIDIA are planning, possibly, to shrink Turing down to 8NM, which is going to be using an extension of Samsung's 10NM node, so that will, of course, reduce the size of the transistors and do all the other bits and pieces you'd expect. So in other words, 7NM Turing is most likely not going to be a thing. Instead, we're going to be seeing 8NM. Now, will this happen next year? That's the question a lot of people have. I don't know. In my personal opinion, and if it happens, it happens. If it doesn't, it doesn't. No one really can predict the future other than NVIDIA themselves. And even they may be doing some guesswork here. I don't think we're going to be seeing this until at least mid-year next year. Think of it this way. If the 2060 and so on are not going to be released until, let's say, I'm just pulling a date out of my butt here, but let's say February-ish next year, which makes sense, right? The Pascal series gets phased out. There's odd stragglers left in uh, retail. Perhaps no one's really going to be that interested in buying a card in January because everyone's going to be broke and so on. So February would probably be about the earliest you can expect the 2060 and the 2050 to appear on store shelves. Therefore, it's not very likely that a couple of weeks later, NVIDIA are then going to release a higher end uh, 20 series card, which would be based on uh, A&M. It just wouldn't make sense. And my personal opinion is the earliest we're going to see a refresh on a smaller process is most likely holiday season 2019. So what does that mean? Well, other than the obvious stuff that we might see, for example, a higher end GTX 28, I'm sorry, RTX 2080, it's possible we could see a plus derivative. There have been a lot of rumours about that. After all, there is a large gap between the 2080 Vanilla and the 2080 Ti. Well, you get where I'm going with this. So that's one distinct possibility that we could be left with. Um, it's really hard to know, of course, what NVIDIA's plans are. And I do suspect some of it as well will, dis will really depend on what threat they feel that AMD are putting out with Navi. So, as usual, stick with us, and of course we'll cover that. Speaking of coverage and, well, how well things perform, let's get into the final major piece of touring news today, and that is a benchmark that's leaked out, excuse me, from Final Fantasy XV. So, of course, Final Fantasy XV is a very, very punishing benchmark indeed, and we have a really nice set of graphs from different resolutions, including uh, 1440p as well as 4K, and they show the performance of the RTX 2080 and the RTX 2080 Ti. So, how do they do? Well, I'm glad you ask. If we were to look at 1440p at the start, and this is the 2080 Ti, it absolutely decimates, it demolishes, it ruffle stomps the Titan V. It really does. I mean, once again, the 1440p standard quality settings, you're looking at 12,000 points compared to 11,650 points, the RTX 2080, meanwhile, scores 9,715 compared to 9,528 of the 1080. What about different uh, results then? What about 1440p high quality? Pretty much the same thing. In fact, there's actually a larger gap between the uh, 2080 Ti and the Titan V. Don't even get me started on the Titan XP because it, it's not even in the runnings here. Once again, 10,030 points for the TI version of the 20 series, 9,223 for the Titan V, and 8,316 for the Titan XP. That is, that's a startling difference. That is a startling difference. And once again, there's a few hundred points difference between the 2080 and the 1080 Ti. Shifting things to the high quality 
And I'm actually really impressed with the difference here. 5,844 points for the 2080 Ti, 5,273 points for the Titan V cards. And once again, we see a rather large separation between the 2080 and the previous cards. So the 2080 uh, scores 4,624 points, whereas the standard GTX 1080 scores just under a smidgen, under 3,400 points. So what does that mean? In my opinion, that's a really nice differential. Some people are saying that previous generation of cards like Pascal really just shot the performance uh, level up there and NVIDIA are not able to match it with the RTX series. In my personal opinion, I don't think that's the case. I know I've gone on record and said this before. Some of you are upset by it, but it's just my personal opinion. I think that Pascal was an outlier in terms of what we had. We had a new architecture. We had a much better uh, manufacturing process. We had the introduction of GDDR5X, which there is a larger gap between 5X and R5 compared to what there is uh, 6 and R5X, if, if that makes any sense. And just a whole bunch of other stuff. So in my personal opinion, when you factor all of those things in, I think it's a pretty damn good jump. And if you were to go back and let's say look at the 980 versus the 780, yeah, you can kind of see the curve there. So I think NVIDIA are doing a really nice job here. And I say that as someone who is not working with NVIDIA, we're not getting a review sample from NVIDIA. We're going to be sourcing ours from AIB and we're purchasing our own card. So this is not like me sucking up to NVIDIA. That's just my personal opinion. However, we do have a couple of final pieces of news for you because we're that nice. And the first piece of news, uh, both of these, by the way, are from Intel side of things. The first piece of news concerns uh, Intel's driver team, which of course are responsible for optimizing graphics drivers for Intel's current generation of uh, GPUs, which of course are mostly iGPUs, as well as the discrete GPUs of the future. And this interview was grabbed from legitreviews.com. I'm not going to post all of it here because that would be unfair to them. I'll place a link, of course, in the video description, but there are a couple of pertinent things that I want you to kind of mull over. So Lisa Pierce uh, said, and I quote, when asked what her role is at the moment at Intel, sure. I started off as a 3D graphics driver developer way back in the day, spent many years focusing on areas like video playback and transcoding, and now I'm the director of Intel's graphics software team as part of the role. I'm chartered to lead the software in transformation that Intel evolved from a processor company to a discrete graphics company. She was also asked what areas Intel wants to improve the most, and she said that's very easy. It's the gaming experience. We have a tremendous amount of work going into improving our gaming experience on the more constrained form factor where integrated graphics are used. This is one area we have made solid strides this year with day zero launch drivers getting best optimal automatic game settings and driver optimiz optimizations. Excuse me. We've still a long way to go, but we're off to a good start. And they've also explained that there are a couple of uh, development boards which are being shown off in some photos that were provided to the interviewers here, but they are not ready to talk about them. They are ready to talk about them in the future. So you can start letting your mind wander. Now, yes, this is not information on Jupiter Sounds. This is not information on Arctic Sounds. This is not telling us the amount of performance they're going to be putting out, the amount of teraflops, damn it, but... For those who were concerned that Intel are just saying, nah, screw gaming, we're just going to focus on this area over here, you know, HPC, this is clearly not the case. And I did suspect this because um, a while ago I did mention that Lisa, I right, covered the fact that Intel were optimizing the graphics drivers much better, they were putting out software that worked kind of similar to GeForce Experience, and of course AMD zones driver suite. So it was kind of obvious that Intel are doing this, and it's good in my opinion. Having different comp competition, it's never a bad thing. Because even if Intel's GPUs, let's say Intel's GPUs are not that great in the high end, but they provide a nice mid-range solution or a low-end solution, that's great. That's just that's just more cards available to the consumer. Or let's say that they're really high performance, but you know, they don't sell that well at the start. It's something for Intel to work on, and it's clear that the verbiage they're using reminds me a little bit of Microsoft. And what I mean by that is Microsoft are clearly really focused on the Xbox. They know that they've got a lot of work to do. They know they have a lot of work to catch up on both AMD, and of course they have a lot of work to catch up uh, NVIDIA. But, well, <laughs> yeah, 
They have that momentum and they're going to get there. And I've said before, and I'll say it again, certain companies, when they jump into something, it's like you woke a sleeping giant. And Intel have a research and development budget, which is really profound. And I do suspect that both AMD and Nvidia are watching them like a hawk. And finally, a small piece of news, and I'll place a link to this in the video description as well. For those who are interested in purchasing an Intel Xeon chip, certain chips are facing a stiff discount. And while it's not being advertised exactly like in massive letters across Intel's various, uh, you know, PDFs and website, we can kind of guess why. It's because of Epic. And say what you will about Epic. Um, it doesn't hit all of the areas as well as Intel, but with Epic 7NM coming out, and if those benchmark leaks that we saw a day or two ago were genuine, I'll place a link to that in the video description if you're curious, but let's just say Cinebench result absolutely demolishes both the current generation of Epic processors as well as anything Intel have to offer. Then again, 64 cores, 128 threads. If it didn't do rather well, I think we'd be a bit like, hmm, AMD, what for you do this to us? So yeah, uh, the discounts are starting to come and it's going to be fascinating to see what AMD will respond with, whether AMD will decide to cut the prices or just say, screw it, we've got the better processes for now, that Intel cut their prices and we're just going to take the market share the best we can. With all of that said, hopefully you have enjoyed the video. For new subscribers, I thank you for subscribing. And well, sorry about the setup. It's not normally like this. I am actually currently traveling. I am in the USA. I am, you know, going to be doing some work. Well, actually, I'm doing a lot of work. Got a couple of interviews I'm going to be attending and, you know, interviewing a couple of companies and stuff. But that's why I'm here because I'm staying at a friend's place. So it's not like, you know, my normal setup where I've got computers and screens in the background. But I would also quite, quite uh, quickly like to thank HP Computers for loaning me the Omen X laptop series. It's very cool of them. This is not a sponsored video. It's just a quick shout out to them for loaning us the laptop because we're going to be doing a full review of uh, some of their products when we get back. Well, when I get back, rather. So, you know, thanks very much to them as well. With all of that said, thanks very much for watching the video. Normal stuff, like, share, comment, and subscribe. You can also see an Amazon affiliate link in the video description. If you're wanting to do any shopping and you want to support us, but you don't want to, you know, donate to us on Patreon, then you can use that instead. Take care of yourselves. Bye for now.